it over to me. <laughs> I couldn't have said that better. So, hi, my name is Philip. I'm very happy to see you all here. I want to welcome you all here. And I want to welcome Clay. This is a talk, Crisis Mapping with CrowdMap. And this talk is part of the digital workshop series for students from the Schornstein uh, Center. This talk today is going to be presented by Clay Shirky, like um, probably as he already mentioned to most of you. Nico won't be with us this evening, but um, I think Clay will do a very, very decent job in filling this very broad gap, but I think he will be able to manage that. <laughs> and so he will basically show us in the end what these maps mean, what you actually can do with them, and we'll see. So I won't talk about that, just very briefly about himself, you know, Clay Shirky, that's sure. this guy, think, the picture, and. It pretty much matches. <laughs> Since the talk will be much more interesting than me telling you 20 minutes about his resume or CV that's online anyway, just some important facts. Like, well, he's the, currently the visiting moral lecturer here at the Schoenstein Center at the Kennedy School. He graduated from Yale, woo, but well, we welcome him here anyway. <laughs> he's a renowned author of the last book, like, Here Comes Everybody, about crowdsourcing the wisdom of the crowds. I could really recommend it to you, and I don't get paid anything for recommending that. <laughs> And he has several contributions to very important journals and pages in the field from Wired to the New York Times to the Harvard Business Review. And to touch on the much more important information on that, I, I asked for some very important facts I want to share with you. So, if it would be a social media tool, I would be, and I left out the answer because I don't actually know that, so probably you can just very briefly in 30 seconds explain what Plato is. Plato was the first uh, platform for social software. It was invented in 1960 in uh, Minnesota, and it was essentially um, the internet in one country, as it were. It was a local, uh, a local social software platform. So in the social patterns uh, of software actually predate the internet by almost a decade. So I call myself Plato because uh, I'm old school like that, so <laughs> I appreciate it. His favorite course, course during grad school or undergrad was Physics of Chaos. I think that's totally cool, so everybody should pick something like that. I don't know what, what kind of information we can get out of the top three of these websites. I asked for that. Well, Google obviously I just counted for, you know, it would be named there, I guess. NetVibes, Twitter, and Dropbox. Well, take your picture. Mm -hmm. So the, the next one was a really tough question that as well the players also Nico had a tough time answering it. Like the number of internet capable devices owns. I wanted to aim like how many tech stuff is actually at home? Like can you actually move besides all your computer smartphones? And I think the number of nine daily use devices still leaves some space. And the last thing, since we should always end up with some kind of very important message, <coughs> one sentence always to keep in mind, then probably you want to read it on your own because it's, it's your message. Well, it's George, it's George Box's message, but I always tell this to my students, all models are wrong, some models are useful, which is to say anytime you're modeling a space like this, you are compressing some parts of it uh, in order to exaggerate others, and to, 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 be able to, to be able to examine any phenomenon. You can't, you can't afford to confuse the model with reality. So you have to pick up models with the sense that they're useful tools, but not that they're actually completely accurate maps of the real map. So thank you very much very for that introduction. Now I'm really looking forward to the introduction of CrowdMap, and there's one very important aspect I'm really looking forward to on the CrowdMap homepage. They tell you you can use it for mapping a zombie apocalypse, and I would be really interested in how we actually do that. So please join me in welcoming my short sure Thank you. Thank you. So yes, this will be. Uh, so we're talking about this in three uh, in three parts. Uh, a little bit of the history of this particular platform, Ushahidi, in advance of uh, of CrowdMap. Then I want to walk through a little bit of what CrowdMap has done to make this kind of crisis mapping easier. And then I want to. Uh, ask what is generally the most uh, the most important question in any attempt to use social software, which is, what could possibly go wrong? Uh, and in this case, the list is fairly long. Uh, I want to emphasize that uh, getting the technology right for crisis mapping has been a significant effort by the Ushahidi team these last few years, and getting the technology right is only a very minor input to getting a useful crisis map right. Uh, we are fortunate to be joined tonight by John Crowley of the Harvard Humanitarian Institute. who has a significant amount of experience in that, and who I think will 
uh, will, I think in particular when it comes around to what could possibly go wrong, will be, will be useful. Um, and obviously, informal, if you have questions or comments, jump in, uh, jump in as we're going. Um, so let me, let me start, as I said, by telling the story of uh, the creation of Ushahidi. Uh, Ushahidi is a platform, it was the precursor platform to CrowdMap, which is essentially Ushahidi in the cloud, Ushahidi on remote servers that you can uh, administer. Ushahidi started, the idea for Ushahidi started in December of 2007 after the disputed presidential election in Kenya. Uh, in the aftermath of that election, there was an outbreak of ethnic violence, principally between Kikuyu and Luo, two of the large ethnic groups in Kenya, although, uh, as always, ethnic violence also had urban versus rural, upper versus lower class, you know, economic, uh, economic and class-based uh, tensions as part of it as well. And in the outbreak of this ethnic violence, in which, uh, which Kenya had managed to avoid uh, for about a decade and a half previously, suddenly there was this sense of, you know, we're, the country's going backwards, right? we're losing ground. There was a very engaged uh, conversation in the press and weblogs about what was going wrong and about how to fix it. And then suddenly, uh, the government stopped the press from writing about it. There was a press blackout on writing about the ethnic violence. And in particular, there was an absolute press blackout on live reporting of any sort. Because the press could not censor quickly enough. They simply banned the ability for the mainstream media to go into the field with a microphone or a camera, put it in front of someone and ask them their opinion. And as a side effect of this removal of the mainstream press from the conversation, weblogs, which had been, as, as they usually are, ancillary consumers of the news and discussers and formers of opinion about the news, moved to the fore as one of the principal sources for information at all. Uh, <clears throat> one, particular, uh, one particular blogger, Oria Kola, who is a lawyer uh, who lives, was a lawyer now, does Ushahidi full time, but was a lawyer living in Nairobi, uh, and ran a very influential blog called Kenyan Pundit, began blogging almost full time uh, during this, 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 this moment immediately after the press blackout, began to solicit comments from her readers who were witnessing uh, ethnic violence. Some of these would come in as long form first person narrative, some of these would come in as short comments in the comment section. Uh, she, would, she would sometimes reformat them, or aggregate them, and repost them. And uh, her contributorship grew, her readership grew, and she very quickly came to the end of what she was capable of doing on her own and said, essentially, I, I, can't, I can't keep up. But I can do this 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There's so much information, so many first-person reports coming in. Uh, if only there was some way to automate this. And with that observation, a couple of programmers uh, who, were, who were also avid readers of, of, of Kenyan Pundit essentially raised their hands in the comments section of her blog and said, we can build that, we can, we can do that. And they got together, sketched out a vision for Ushahidi. The name means uh, witness or, or testimony in Swahili. And within two days, I should actually go back to an earlier picture of Ushahidi. Within two days of having developed, of, of having sketched it out, this, well, I'll just go to one of the maps. Um, Within two days of having sketched it out, they had the first version of it up and running. And I'm trying to get to a larger map to show you how it go. So here is what a new Shihudi install looks like. It's essentially a set of reports that come in from the field of any given crisis that then get uh, geocoded and aggregated on that. Uh, and so this is this is a map that was deployed for the, for the Louisiana fuel spill, the Louisiana oil spill. And you can see what Ushahidi is doing. Right? It is surfacing the tacit knowledge of a community. Right? So during the uh, during the post-election violence in Kenya, the problem that Okola had, had hit on, is that everybody knows where the violence is, right? The violence is always done to someone. So someone's been attacked. They have friends or neighbors or family, or they themselves survive the attack. And so, cumulatively, everybody knows where the violence is. And at the same time, nobody knows where the violence is. 
because there is no way to take the individual bits of knowledge and turn it into anything anybody uh, can look at or work with. So what Ushidi was set up to do is to link up the little distributed tacit bits of knowledge into something that was not just aggregated but coded well enough that people could see at a glance uh, what uh, what was going on. So you know, it, it, an example here again with the, uh, I can't tell if this is interactive or not, but simply, no, this is just a screenshot. So you can see here that the, uh, you can see where the oil reports, in, for example, are concentrated. This is material surface from the field. Uh, in, the, in the case of the original Ushahidi install, of course, it was, it was post-election violence intended to be in service. And as you can see from this map, in the years since Ushahidi was first launched, um, less than three years, it's now spread worldwide. Right, the, the people who built it said this worked well enough that we should make this in general capabilities. They turned it into a platform. Um, Louisiana oil spill map, as I said, uh, there was a, uh, an Atlanta crime map in Mexico. It was used uh, to track the risk of voter fraud. Uh, Washington, D.C. was used to track snow <laughs> removal, first, first world problems, uh, <laughs> and you know, spread, spread worldwide. So I want to I call your attention to three features of this story uh, in, the, in the years between, between the, the invention of the platform and then. Uh, the first is that it is a way of taking tacit knowledge and making it not just aggregated, but visible and uh, useful in ways that it's not, that it's not the case when it's, when it's just left tacit. Uh, the second is that it is a fusion of very high-tech and very low-tech tools. Uh, that although the availability of web servers, Google Maps, and so forth is essential to making the output work, uh, mobile phones with nothing more complicated than SMS are essential to making the input work. So rather than being an either a completely high-tech or completely low-tech solution, this is actually a hybrid solution of the sort that I think we're going to see an increasing amount of. And when I say mobile phone, I don't mean iPhone 4. I mean the Nokia 1100, right? The most widely distributed electronic device in the world. The thing that can only make calls or SMS is still an input here. So whereas we still have a rhetoric of the internet is like this, whereas mobile phones are like that, uh, what we see with Ushahidi is that it's possible now to build fused platforms that are more valuable than if they were just built on the web or if they were just built with mobile phones. And the third, the third piece of this, which is, I think, in a way most relevant to the Kennedy School's mission, is that there's almost no technology work here. Uh, as Eric Hirschman has said, one of the, one of the, the five original, uh, five original uh, founders of Ushahidi, one of the five original programmers of Ushahidi, there was no piece of this that had not been lying around for at least five years. Google Maps was already up and running. Phones with SMSs were already in people's pockets. Right? Uh, you had the web. You had these servers. You had these databases. All of this stuff was lying around in bits and pieces. But Ushahidi didn't happen as a side effect of having that technology. <coughs> Ushahidi had to be put together by people who could make a credible accounting for why it would be a good idea to use. So Ushahidi is better thought of not as a case of technology design, but as opportunity design that what the people who put Ushidi together were doing was saying, all of these tools are only going to be useful if we can convince you to tell us where the violence is. And uh, stop me if I get the details, uh, uh, if, I, if I gloss over the, the important details here, but the, a, a Harvard Humanitarian Initiative report done on the original Ushahidi install track in the, the Kenyan violence said, that Ushahidi outperformed the mainstream press in, in, in reporting the violence, especially in rural areas, <coughs> uh, which for the obvious reasons didn't get, uh, didn't get coverage, and also, most importantly, for non-fatal violence. And non-fatal violence, because of you know, the classic it leads, it leads uh, issue with newspapers, non-fatal violence, reports of non-fatal violence, turned out to be a useful predictor of future fatal violence, which is to say, that, that a prevalence of low-level attacks uh, was a precursor to later, uh, later violence. So in 
in articulating this opportunity, Ushidi had to get the technology right, but they also had to get the opportunity design right. They had to be able to go to people and offer a convincing set of reasons for why, uh, why you want to participate. So, uh, that is that is Ushahidi uh, in a nutshell. It it um, has become the most publicly visible tool for engaging in what's called crisis mapping. Uh, crisis mapping is a way of trying to create a geographic representation of a particular region under a particular set of stresses. Right? Maps are often static representations of uh, actually dynamic but slow processes. Crises are often dynamic and fast. So after an earthquake, a map of where the roads used to be is of almost no use at all. Because some of those roads may well be impassable if you only discover which roads are impassable. After you've taken a truck of supplies halfway down them, uh, you'd actually have been better off if you didn't have that map in the first place. So Ushahidi is a way of trying to serve, or crisis mapping in general is a way of saying, the dynamic conditions during a crisis defeat ordinary maps, which may either be of inferior quality or simply may not be available at all. And yet what maps do is they allow people who have just arrived to operate with some of the certainty of locals, which during a crisis you would very much like to have the nominal first responders who are, in point of fact, actually the second responders, the first responders being the people to whom the crisis happened. But, but the, people, the people historically called first responders need these <coughs> maps in order to be able to operate. Uh, Ushahidi is, is a, a version of crisis mapping, but is the one that's, uh, that's gotten, uh, I think, most of the public attention, particularly in the aftermath of the Port au Prince quake, uh, the, the earthquake in Haiti at the beginning of this year. Um, a, uh, an implementation of Ushahidi was set up almost immediately. And additional crowdsourcing tools like Crowdflower and translating SMSs from Creole to English, often using, interestingly, Boston cab drivers. Um, <coughs> meant that it became one of the most visible attempts to use it. So that's, that's the background <coughs> on Ushahidi and crisis mapping on one of this map. The downside of all of this was that you can see here there's a download the platform version 1.1 mode of issue, is that it's very difficult to install and very difficult, it's very difficult to get up and running, it's very difficult to keep up and running. That for all of the, um, uh, all of the fact that the technology was lying around, as I said, this being mainly a matter of opportunity design and articulating existing technologies, once you say not, we have a single instance of this on our servers, but we would like to make anybody in the world able to run this, it becomes much harder because all of a sudden you start dealing with a variety of server architectures, uh, unfamiliar IP address blocks, and, and, and the need for API keys to access things like Google Maps. And so Ushini turned out to be, despite the fact that it was open source and, and, and universally available, uh, it turned out not to be terribly useful. So enter CrowdMap. <coughs> CrowdMap launched, uh, they launched CrowdMap uh, this August. CrowdMap is an attempt to take Ushahini and make it available to anybody as a service rather than as a product. Right, so this is, this is a shift in saying, you don't download this and install it and set yourself up as an administrator. You just fill out a form. And you will have an instance of Ushahidi running on the internet, which you can then have. So uh, you can see here, if you click this, we're now in the sort of technical walkthrough. Uh, you would go and sign yourself up for an account. Uh, and you give them the standard kinds of things you give. It's just one page of data, very little, uh, very little information needed just some sense of an address and what they call deployments, right? Uh, pushing this out. So I've created uh, an Ushahidi install, which you can look at. It's at hkstest.crowdmap.com. Uh, um, I've decided to track fashion emergencies. So, uh, of which there are not some several committed in Cambridge on any given, uh, on any given weekday. So, uh, I would go, having set myself up as the administrator, Having set myself up as the administrator, I now have access to this pristine Ushidians or pristine crowd methods. So I can now manipulate this as I like to reflect the things that I am uh, interested in or care about. You can see that I have lots of reporting here and that all of it's empty. 
uh, <laughs> because no one's no one's reported any fashion emergencies yet. Uh, first thing I need to do is go through and <coughs> fill out the categories. I filled out some of this already. Uh, so category one will label misdemeanor. Um, <laughs> And that's if you wear all gap all the time. Uh, oh, hang on, cancel. Uh, I to to save. And you can see this has the usual degree of editability of, of, of any of these things. Uh, category two, we'll call felony. Badly mismatched pieces. Save that. Category three, we'll call hanging offense. The description is shirky level atrocity. <laughs> Having saved those categories, the internet can smell live demos and generally acts badly, but we'll see if this actually works. Yes, misdemeanor felony hanging offense. You can see I've now modified what the user sees from that panel. And I will not obviously walk through all of the administrative pieces, but that is the basic idea. That you get a raw install, um, and then you can uh, you can add it or adapt it as you like. Very little visual adaptation, which is actually probably good. It saves you from fussing around with the font too much. But you can change uh, you can change the way. Now they centered this uh, uh, they centered this on Nairobi for the obvious reason. It's, it's sort of there. Um, since that's where that's where home is, the, the the programs operate there. I will recenter us. I will recenter us to Cambridge, Massachusetts, home of many fashion agencies. How do I do? Okay. All right. I'm sorry, you. So I can now go to Massachusetts. There we go. Go to Massachusetts, zoom in on the map. So this is the web-based mode of reporting here, which I'm going to report something using the web interface. I'm on the South Shore thing. <laughs> I am not so, I have, I have a New Yorker sense of. There you go. There you go. All right. Oh, there we are. Yes, yeah, great. Okay. So, fill in one more. This is what I love about those Keanu Reeves interfaces, where you look things up by manipulating a globe and zooming in. It assumes that Americans can find things on the map, which turns out to be a fairly significant bug in the, in the interface. All right, drill in. So this is Yeah, MIT, right. The Kendall Street tea stop, in fact, I think. Where we go. So how to report, filling in this form. Uh, sandals. With socks. <laughs> Kendall. Uh, Birkenstocks. And white socks. <laughs> and you all decide is that a felony or a hanging offense? Felony. 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 <laughs> so, uh, Unix programmer who got off easy. Uh, do sandals with socks a lot? And then you can see here I can add a link to a news source, I can add a link to video, I can upload photos. So yes. So you don't need to actually be there. It's not like Foursquare where it picks up your location. You can actually update it from here. And no, then right. So the great the great tension, and we'll 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 talk about this. The great tension uh, in all of this is <coughs> if you have a non-location aware device, uh, you still need to be able to let people say something about location if you care about lowest common denominator participation. So if, for example, you want people to be able to write down a street corner in an SMS on a Nokia 1100, you can't geolocate. Mm -hmm. Foursquare, because it's designed only for location-aware services, can say, if you're on an Android or an iPhone and you're not giving us your location, that's your problem, not our problem. So you're assuming people won't 
while manipulating. No, in fact, they're not assuming that at all. So this is one of the great. This is one of the great issues: is under what circumstances do you trust the data? Um, so in the case of Boston, with the crowd map rerouting, very often it was the Boston community taking things off of either the web or taking things in on SMS and posting from here to locate things in, in port of promise So the, uh, the, the proximal step before it got to the database, the computer just before it got to the database, was actually often uh, local, and yet it was uh, a second order, you know, people were translating from Creole or just pulling information off the web and adding it, adding it here. There is, uh, in all crowdsourced services, there is a tension between ease of participation and uh, essentially the ability to vet the participants themselves the quality of the data. Uh, there are uh, several different strategies for dealing with the problem, but it is, it is always a problem. Um, Ushihidi offers a, or sorry, CrowdMap offers a, uh, uh, a concept of a known user, someone whose email address or phone number is whitelisted. Uh, there's also a service that they're working on called Swift River, which is uh, to look for algorithmically significant signs of either high likelihood that this is correct or high likelihood that this isn't correct. Um, because uh, the answer for these kinds of services has generally been answer for these kinds of services has generally been the way to deal with bad data is more data. Right? So in the same way that Google is able to wash out uh, a certain class of attacks on its uh, on its search uh, search database or spam, uh, one of the goals of anything like uh, like a CrowdMap install is simply to get enough participation that you can have some confidence that what you're doing with this is, is... Like Wikipedia? I mean, like, you, 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 you monitor each other? It's not, it's not exactly in the sense of peer review, um, although there is a kind, there is a sort of flag this report as being unusually suspect. Um, the Iranians did this, uh, not, not with these kinds of installs, but the Iranians did this on uh, Twitter, where they would begin to inject the commonly used hashtag with, uh, you know, either mistaken information or information that would seem to divide the crowd, including at one point saying, oh, the Iranians are monitoring this hashtag, go use this other hashtag, as if the whole thing wasn't public. So it's, it's, it's much more about watching the existing signal than it is about peer review in the Wikipedia model. But it is similar to Wikipedia in that the, it, to, to make something like this work, either a relatively small set of known users uh, is needed. In some cases, for example, uh, NGOs using this will only whitelist their own employees, or having such a large, uh, uh, having such a large participant base that individual reports don't actually show up as being particularly salient. The same piece of data has to come in sort of, sort of three or four times. Oh, sorry, the uh, what this then gives you. Uh, what the CrowdMap platform then gives you is the ability to reset all of these defaults. Um, so the default uh, location being set here in Kenya, I could actually say I'm going to reset the default location in the United States. United States. And there we go. And then does it span multiple <laughs> countries, yes or no? I can, I can pick a default map view. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Again, I'm not going to walk you through all of uh, all of these options, but once you set up a CrowdMap install, you have to go in and 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 customize it to the crisis or the map you would like to create. Uh, and then, where it still gets complicated, unfortunately, is I've just walked you through submitting a report on the web but you would like to take in SMS or uh, email as well. And those are not yet built into the cloud-based install. Uh, so to take in email, you actually have to tie it to a mail server in the kind of, you know, body, here's the SMTP setting, here's the IMAP or POP setting, etc. Um, they may be able to make this more cloud-friendly. Uh, but there are also enough places that will give you a mail server that uh, you can set it up on your own. And most difficult of all is the SMS piece, uh, which 
typically requires a piece of software like Frontline SMS, which is essentially a customized server designed to run on laptops that forms a bridge between an individual phone and uh, Frontline, which is what then accepts SMS messages into the phone, reads them into the database, and shares them with the machine. Uh, I, won't, I won't walk you through a Frontline install because that's also uh, annoying. Yes, I hear the, the bitter line. It's far more complex than yeah. anything. Yeah. But I wanted to, I wanted to offer this up as an observation about essentially what's what's possible, right? So we've gone now from here's this here's this general capability to take uh, take tacit knowledge from the community manifested on a map to now being able to do it at least from the web with uh, a handful of clicks as you saw, uh, and then the last the last step is and still the technically difficult step is if you want to expand that to taking in information from email address. What's that? <coughs> it doesn't support Symbian for iPhone or Blackberry or Windows Mobile. It is right. It is GSM. It's looking for a GSM mode. Frontline. Uh -huh. Frontline is designed for uh, low-tech phones, so it's looking for. I don't know. I'm sorry. I just turned off. It. It, uh, it is designed for GSM modems. Uh, precisely because that is the work. so Frontline. Um, one of a handful of services designed to do this uh, is is designed for the um, the standard for basic phones, not the standard for smartphones. So uh, that having been said, uh, when it says it doesn't support these phones, it doesn't mean it doesn't support reports from these phones, but rather when you use a phone as a GSM motor. It needs to be a standard phone, not one of the smartphones. So it's the receiving phone that needs to be a Nokia 1100, not the transmitting phone. So you can certainly take an SMS message in from any of those platforms because SMS is really the thing it cares about. But in the field, you need you need Frontline on the box plus uh, plus a, a, a simple phone as a GSM mode. So that is. Uh, that is the technology piece of it, and it has dramatically lowered the not to nothing, uh, the difficulty of setting up a crowd map service, if you want. Uh, Eric Hirschman, the, the uh, leader, the tech lead of Ushahidi, uh, has a slide he puts up uh, which says, essentially, of the 100% of the stuff you need to do to get this working right, Ushahidi takes care of about 10% of it. Um, that figure, in fact, may even be overstated. Um, which brings me to the third uh, third thing I wanted to talk about, which is what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> so here you are. You have this crisis map. Uh, you've gone. You've explained to your users what the categories are, and you've given them all sorts of ways to report things. Uh, why will goodness not now just naturally flow from, from your technological work? There are a bunch of reasons. The first, and absolutely commonest for all use of social media, is that it will simply be inert. It's not even that it will fail uh, after some implementation, but that no one will use it. Uh, the, the failure at the level of marketing is the absolute commonest failure for social media, which is either that you don't reach enough people who would want to use it to get critical mass, or the people you reach are not the right people. Or you reach the right people, but you didn't convince them to use it. Right? This is what I mean about opportunity design as opposed to technology design. As easy as Ushahidi was, it was still a significant amount of work. CrowdMap reduces that dramatically. But funnily enough, as a result, I think we will expect to see the number of, of uh, versions of Ushahidi that fail uh, to go up with ease of use rather than to go down, which is to say the number of people who erroneously assume that the technology is the big obstacle will grow. So the, the, the first and commonest class of failure with crowd mapping is simply that no one generates any data. It is, it is a rule of thumb only, but as a rule of thumb, we would expect about half of Ushahidi installs, give or take, to, to, to simply fail to get any data at all. So that's just across a fairly wide range of things from open source projects to, to uh, public mailing lists, 
you see it's about a 50% uh, rate of just abject flow. Uh, <coughs> after that, there's a fairly profound risk in crisis of actually subdividing the potentially relevant population, which is to say when the oil spill, uh, when the, uh, the BP oil spill started in the Gulf of Mexico, enough people had been habituated to the idea that a crisis needs a map and that Ushihidi is a good way to do this, that several competing Ushihidi maps arose. And so what, what seems like a noble gesture can actually end up splitting the community rather than, than giving it some place to concentrate. Um, in their, um, you know, using crowd map for emergencies, their sort of five-step setup, which is, to my eye, still a little too chirpy, uh, they, they, this is the one danger they highlight, which is it may well be that somebody else has already done this. Um, and this is where we get into the narcissism of small differences. It's difficult to convince two groups of people who have slightly different views of what a crisis is and how they can help uh, to agree to pool their efforts. Um, a, a, you know, a sad, uh, a sad fact of human human life, but, but nevertheless a, a risk. Um, third risk is that you get the wrong information. Right? So this this is the question of um, you either get flooded with useless information. There was a there was a famous case where uh, uh, a a uh, beloved, excuse me, uh, member of uh, essentially the Silicon Valley tribe went down in an airplane in uh, some rugged mountains in the, in the American West. And the idea was that they would crowdsource the looking for the wreckage of the craft. And so a map was put up and they were given, uh, the general public was given access to the map. This is what his plane looked like. This is what wreckage might look like. Go through the map and see. Uh, and the Civil Aviation Administration loathed that experiment. Because, of course, it's no fun to just look at a map all day and come up with complete failure. Right? I just spent four hours trying to help and I accomplished absolutely nothing. And so the number of false positives went through the roof. Because everybody so desperately wanted to see that plane that they would report anything that looked like an anomaly in a, in a, you know, uh, in a group of trees or, or, or in a collection of rocks. So you can end up with either intentionally misstated information if, if you're dealing with a, a circumstance where there's system gaming, or simply information that's you know, sort of sort of junk information. Uh, you can end up creating a sense of, oh, you could help driving traffic up and then a subsequent just collapse of it. This is the sort of slacktivism complaint, where people think they can make the world better by you know clicking on things. Sort of the you see this happen on Facebook sometimes, the sort of shout-outs for ending world hunger sort of, uh, sort of problem, um, where somehow the idea is that by projecting goodwill into a series of mouse clicks, I can make the world a better place. Uh, it's, it's easy to generate that kind of excitement. It's, it's also easy for that kind of excitement to go away. Uh, and then the fifth risk, and this is really the biggest one of all, and this is, to my eye, true of almost all Ushahidi installs so far, which is that you will or almost all otherwise successful issue is also for, is that you will in fact correctly generate useful information and that no one will use it. Um, the great, great risk of all of this <laughs> is that even if you get everything right, uh, it goes back to the original our humanitarian initiative study, which said, A, Ushahidi correctly predicted outbreaks of fatal violence, and B, the government did absolutely nothing about that. Right? Which is to say, information is not power. Uh, we are used to information being power when, inf when information was scarce, but now that information is becoming increasingly less scarce, it's also being increasingly decoupled from power. Ep information used to be epiphenomenal on power, uh, and in many ways now it is not. So it is possible to generate a crowd map which, which creates uh, an otherwise invisible, takes otherwise invisible, uh, the invisible armature of an emergency, manifests it in a way that, that people could do something useful with and that nothing happens with that. So with that, um, with that, let me end and, and open it up for conversation because I think that that, uh, that this, this last piece of it, which is there's been a big 
improvement in our ability to get the technology right and also getting the technology right is not as useful for crisis mapping as a whole uh, as we would like it to be. Um, let me open it up from there. I'm sorry, did you have a... Yeah. Um, so you were talking about how the, the great thing about it was that it had married um, a very simple technology with a pretty high-tech technology. Mm -hmm. And it seems like, it sounds like the next step is to marriage the openness and knowledge that you're getting from your community with somewhat of the official response. Because yes. it seems like that's the complaint is that there are certain aspects that have to be done officially. So in the sense of violence, I need to put some more police officers on that street corner because I probably don't want every individual becoming a vigilante. And so it seems like that's the next step. And has there been a thought process of how you start to take this side of the people and marriage it with a somewhat rigid, formal side that might not always be welcome to that knowledge. That was a polite way of saying that. I'll let John uh, The mapping of the formal up to the informal and of doing the interfaces between traditional humanitarian response and this emerging new uh, source of, of information is a real sticking point, something that has, I think, consumed our summer. Uh, ultimately, what happened in Haiti really changed what people, uh, particularly traditional humanitarian community, thought was possible. That said, it also introduces an enormous range of issues. Uh, not just that there might be a lack of inaction, or there might come, an action might result from the availability of good information, uh, primarily because the folks on the ground are overwhelmed, or they distrust the information. Um, right now, information management as a whole is trying to reconceive of what that interface is going to be. There are a bunch of working groups that are trying to confront that, one on the UN side, one on the, actually several on the UN side, uh, one on the U.S. military side, which would have been the Joint Task Force Haiti. Um, uh, I wish I could say that were the case for state. I think they're doing it, but uh, ultimately the, there is a group there that, that's working on the issue. But that that interface is a really hard problem. I could go into more details on why, but I don't want to take up too much of that. I'll make one, just one additional observation, which is um, regret for things you do is a much more powerful emotion than regret for things you don't do. And so um, I see this with a, a group of my students have developed a. Uh, digital input for recording information about children separated from their families during times of crisis, the so-called family tracing and reunification problem. And they are running into exactly the analogous issues, which is if we use this system and something will go wrong, the child will be harmed. Uh, against the reality that when the families were separated in the Haiti quake, the response is that literally somewhere in Norway they start putting carbon paper on a plane. The current format for collecting information is, I mean, to drag it into the 1990s would be an enormous achievement. But the harm done from having a slow and inefficient process is not experienced as regret in the same way. And so these organizations are naturally and by and large appropriately conservative, but what it means is that in addition to getting it right, you also have to create a situation in which uh, it seemed to be acceptable because every 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 system creates both false positives and false negatives. Right? Creates creates sins of omission and sins of commission. But for a whole variety of reasons, ranging from basic human psychology to uh, career paths and bureaucracy, sins of omission are far more uh, guarded against, and so. The sense that these things change the sense of what's possible. A lot of NGOs' response now has been, we need to train our own people to have our own internal Ushahidi. And I think the response from a lot of the crisis map community, I can't speak for HHI, but is to say, why don't you embed your community as whitelisted inside a larger map with the invitation that, why don't you see if the, if the information from the outside world is that much less accurate than information from your own, your own employees? Um, it, we still don't know, or it, it, it's still an open question, how much of this is bureaucratic curse sitting and how much of this is genuine concern over sins of omission, but, but these hurdles are, are 
in, in organizations with highly conserved on the ground cultures, these hurdles are a big deal. They also have some really valid criticisms. Um, one of which is these new communities don't have real funding sources behind them. Their carrying capacity is quite low. Even though they have a surge capacity, they can get volunteers in the numbers of thousands for two weeks. Their capability of dealing with an operation that's months long is very weak. Um, a second problem is understanding the training and credential of the people who are involved. In some cases, uh, many of the analysts who have been working on some particular imagery are more qualified than some of the people that are working inside the UN, and they've been very surprised to discover that. In other cases, it's well-meaning people who might not necessarily be the folks that they would select for their operation. Like the Steve Fawcett looking for the airplane thing, which is not the people you want. Um, there's another issue in that uh, if you're going to have this type of interface, the interface itself has to work. There is no protocol. Um, and right now, for an organization that's deeply, it has a deep belief structure and process, particularly the United Nations. And I think that process, by and large, can work. The problem is often in the bureaucracy around it. But if, unless you work through the process, you're going to get spit out by the process. And what happens with crowds is impatience. They are not willing to work through the process. And as a result, they get spit out. Um, so there's a, a lack of trust and oftentimes a, a, a misperception of ineptitude because they're not, a, not able to work through systems that already exist. And that exists oftentimes for a very good reason. Yes, um, can you elaborate in the Haiti example or another one on the offline organizing strategy or, or coalition or relationship building strategy that needs to happen to make this effective? I heard anecdotally in Haiti about, for example, one very famous radio commentator that opened up his studio, his station, to announce the Usha Haiti drive. And so it seems like a lot of offline work has to happen for the critical mass. Absolutely. I mean, getting. The, the, the frankly the biggest hurdle was getting the 4636 short code, SMS short code, which came uh, from state to Haitian telecom companies. That was not something that Patrick Patrick Meyer, who set up the the, uh, the Haiti stuff, could have could have done on his own. And then there's a lot of you know social proof, right? That that, that to get somebody in an NGO, you know, as John said, to get somebody in an NGO to adopt something. You want to hear from somebody else in another NGO um, that they're using and that it's that it's okay. Um, you, so it's it's you know social social proof is almost always at least one of the things you need to do offline. Yeah, in, in terms of giving a specific example of how that occurred on the ground, um, for locating people in port of prince uh, with coming up with reports, many of these tweets were "Hi, I'm trapped. I'm in 25 Del, uh, Del Mas. and I. There is no good map to find out where is that location. Oftentimes, it will be landmarks, um, which there was no good map except for uh, folks who went through tour guides to try and find out where that location might be. Uh, in the process of doing that, uh, there were open Skype chats with several of my colleagues on the ground. And those colleagues were closely tied by social relationships over multiple disasters to be able to do a disaster assessment center on that. Uh, that Skype chat of watching individuals, first off, begin to map the real and street map, which is a whole other problem. Yeah. Um, and the second problem of taking these reports in Creole from text messages, translating them, putting them on the open street map, providing a GPS coordinate, having that flow through a Skype chat while an UNDAC team was looking over someone's shoulder well, away. in the dark. UNDAC is a UN disaster assessment center. Uh, standing over someone looking at the dark, looking at the GPS plot, looking at their own map, and then making a determination from that set of personal relationships around that laptop what action they were going to take on a report that was never viewed on that Ushihidi map. Um, it was done through Skype. Uh, there's another reason for this is that bandwidth's really low. Going in and out of a disaster, you're not going to have the bandwidth to be pulling this web page up all the time. Uh, you're going to be sending things probably by the lowest bandwidth you can do. 
and that's often called Skype, Skype chat or just a text chat. Um, but those relationships uh, are critical. Uh, now, mobilizing that collective power, but mobilizing relational power is something that the traditional humanitarian response community um, doesn't rock in this circumstance. They get it. They, I mean, they're incredible uh, about building relationships on the ground. But doing it through this mechanism is not something that's familiar. Uh, the folks who are work working on the ground, whether Shahidi didn't arrive until was February? No, late January. So it was a uh, you know, getting those mobilization uh, of getting Yaroslav and Sabina, the two folks from Fletcher School who went down, getting them on the ground was key to being able to expand the use of it. They were literally going tent to tent, convincing people to look at Ushahi. And similarly for Open Street Map team, they went down uh, about the same time of convincing people to look. Now, Ushahidi as a whole, in terms of the actual urban search and rescue effort, provided this little teeny slip, honestly, in terms of the large context of what they were doing. Most of their reports came in by email, pieces of paper, uh, verbal reports. They were working in a very traditional means. But um, for OpenStreetMap, which is a whole different scenario, they their work on the ground in mobilizing collective power, uh, of convincing people that this platform which had a thousand, more than a thousand volunteers working on Haiti, usurped traditional mapping, uh, installed OpenStreetMap as the de facto map for almost for most of the UN agencies, not all. And then US military switched over to it, uh, and quite a number of NGOs also switched over to using OpenStreetMap. So that mobilization was literally a face-to-face, tent-to-tent operation. That's all within log base, however. What you brought up is actually on the outside. I don't think we have enough data to understand how that worked. Haiti is an incredibly social culture, and social networks are very important, perhaps uh, stronger than we ever realized and probably should have mobilized to more diaspora work. But that after the question that you asked, I don't know if we have a full answer. Um, I was just wondering, yeah, it seems like a lot of the problems that arise out of this uh, crisis mapping can be overcome with planning. <clears throat> so, like, would you agree that maybe if crisis mapping was sort of set as a protocol for a lot of this crisis, for example, uh, it could, you know, it could be something very useful. Like, if in, in certain disasters you already have a, a number that is publicized. So, like, if an earthquake or another natural disaster, right to this number, have people already trained? Because it can be quite yeah. decentralized. So, yeah. if you plan, it could actually be, like, a lot more useful. That's yeah. good. Continue this question, but I'm, like, a big package. <coughs> yes. Control center, like, in a box. Laptops, building with but maps, it's powers, generators. But laptops. here's the thing, that Well, oh, the, the, the if, you, if, you're talk, if you're talking about yeah. the moving generators, and that's a, that's a different thing, but in terms of the information piece, it's not so much having the box. That, not that that's not important. There, there's work at UNICEF on something called the B, which is essentially a self-contained drop it in the field, GSM modem, Wi-Fi bridging, you know, solar power, the kind of things you want there. But I think what Francisco's getting at, which I think is, is another sort of, this is the next step step, uh, is since you know it's going to happen. So the city of San Francisco is doing this right now. They said, look, when the earthquake comes, we know what's going to happen. The Wikipedia page will get created. The short code will get created. The, the, the Ushihidi map will get created. Like, we have some sense of the kinds of things that will be deployed right away. Why not get ready for it? So it's early days for this exploration, but it's exactly what you said, which is, um, I think your point about the social piece on the ground, the first responders are the people who are there when the crisis hits. The second responders are the people we call the first responders, who are the people who were sent in, the disaster, the disaster relief people. But in the first 72 hours, and in particular the first 24 hours, the people who are around to put out fires, uh, you know, bandage each other's wounds, you know, assess the damage, so forth. To the degree that we can take advantage of that, that would be an enormous, uh, that would be an enormous uh, help. Particularly for things like which roads have suddenly become impassable. Uh, because right now, the way you discover roads impassable is you drive a truck full of valuable supplies down it, and then you can't get that truck 
to where it needs to go. That's a very expensive way of figuring out the roads and paths. Um, they did a little bit of this with the Ushi install around the Santiago, uh, around the Santiago quake in, in, uh, in Chile, but the, the, the really dramatically, like what's next idea is civil preparedness on the part of non-professionals. And this gets back to, will the professionals and the non-professionals even be able to bridge the gap of will I trust this information? But uh, this also probably will be tip by tip, as, as you said. There's right. one other opportunity in all of this, and that's, um, we, we've already seen in the societies that have set up codes for 911 type systems. The success in the population using it in Chile was what's going on, 112, 103, if I recall correctly. Um, the dream would be to get the ITU to establish a protocol for stuff for short codes mm -hmm. that are internationally published and can be as an education campaign as opposed to a pre preparation campaign. Um, there's a huge hurdle for doing this, however, and that's the economic incentive of both private and nationalized carriers to allow for the short code because this actually costs money. So who is going to solve that economic problem? I put that out as a challenge to the world. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think this question may have been partly answered, but I was wondering about sort of the, the perhaps the next step beyond that. And I was interested in the branding choice to call it crowd map instead of crisis map, um, and whether that signals an attempt to reach beyond the crisis and sort of make this something that's used for like the fashion disaster thing that you were using to demonstrate it. Like, because that that is in a certain sense where the social proof happens, where people get comfortable with it and sort of, you know, like Twitter, you know, it's integrated into a lot of people's daily lives and therefore it's much useful for, as we were talking about today, the green wave in Iran. Um, so I'm wondering if the crowd map people are thinking about that and what role that, those kinds of uh, opportunities yeah. play. I don't, I don't know if they're, I don't know if they're thinking about it or not, but it is, it is, it is the case that tools that are made specifically to be deployed in case of emergency are less familiar to users than things that they're habituated to. Uh, in another context, Ethan Zuckerman calls this the cute cat theory of political dissent, which is that there have been a bunch of people trying to make dissident specific tools, which have turned out to be, for the obvious reason, relatively easy for the state to shut down because the dissidents, by definition, don't have a broad political uh, base, but you can't cut off YouTube very easily if you have a, na a national population habituated to using it uh, without generating some kind of political unrest. Yeah. So it may be that CrowdMap is doing that. I think they have at least the example before them of Snowmageddon, the, the snow removal uh, map in, in Washington. And it may be that calling, you know, the, the inability of somebody in, in um, Adams Morgan to get out of their front driveway in the morning, calling that a crisis in the same way that you would call the Kenyan election violence and, 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 and Port of Prince quake a crisis may just have been, you know, a bridge a bridge too far. But they may also be thinking if we can get more people to use this for generic mapping, because it's open source, what they need is the maximum number of intuitions about innovative new uses of the system. Mm -hmm. And very often open sourcing something is a way of saying Please use it for silly things. Use it, use it for fashion disasters because we'll get you to debunk the platform better than if it's just bugs are only discovered after the volcano is erupted. Um, so I don't. I mean, I'll ask Eric. It's an interesting question. Uh, those, the, if they're thinking about it, I think those would be the rationales mm -hmm. uh, that they'd be thinking about. Yes, uh, that was exactly my question. That's exactly your question. <laughs> so yeah, I want to add. Like, that was what I, what I mentioned in my very first introduction. Actually, on the homepage, they I, I think they encourage these things like with you can map a zombie apocalypse or use it for whatever. Oh, for yes, for whatever stuff. So I think they're trying to to get more usage out of it and just more, just to to improve it further. I can actually answer that. Oh, great. Um, I was in the IHUB, which is where it's created in Kenya, just two weeks ago, and they were giving a lecture on business uses for CrowdMap. Yeah. Um, how Coca-Cola could use it to map happiness as part of their advertising campaign or different things like that. Um, and what's interesting, I think, about that is that because it's being done in Kenya, uh, they do a lot of programming in Kenya, and everyone in the tech space in Kenya is very informed on what the platform does, how the API works, how things like that work. But because it's only ever publicized as a crisis tool outside of it, that sort of is slowly catching up. 
This is something else I want to point out about, about um, uh, opportunity design, which I neglected to say earlier. We're people who think about the spread of these technologies. We're all used to the sentence, this technology was invented in Mountain View, California, and spread world. <laughs> Anybody who, who writes about technology has that sentence as a macro. We're not used to the sentence, this technology was invented in Nairobi, Kenya, and spread worldwide. That's a new kind of sentence. And I think that the lesson I am drawing from Ushahidi, although we will, time will tell whether this is right or not, is that the, uh, the facility for opportunity design is much more widespread than the facility for the kind of deep tech that requires building a new database or a new chip. And so while worldwide we have a collection of maybe half a dozen significant tech cities, uh, the number of places where the social intuition required for opportunity design is vastly larger than that. And I, I believe that Ushahini is one of the early examples of articulating an opportunity with existing technology that nevertheless makes a new thing. But I'm anticipating that we see considerably more locuses of loci, whatever the word is, of international development uh, because of that. And IHUB, interestingly, which is uh, a related effort uh, on the part of the, the Ushidi people, is, is I think one of, those, one of those places. What were you doing there, by the way? Research on this topic. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. How many, how many people are working there now? At the IHUB? Yeah. Or Ush so Ushidi has a development staff like in the office of about five mm -hmm. core people. And the iHub is open to anyone in Nairobi to do any sort of innovation. And so as of, I guess, this morning, they just announced they have 102 members who are allowed to come in and use the space whenever they want. Um, so you have a swipe card, and it's a very sort of collaborative tech space. And it's sort of like a bubble of San Francisco on the top of a shopping center in Nairobi. <laughs> and can I add one thing that I think Nico would probably say if he was here, yep. which is one of his favorite lines, which is, with, all, with enough eyeballs, I'll all bugs are shallow. Yeah. I think I got that right. Yes. Um, this whole thread of the conversation reminds me of that. Yes. Well, this is, I mean, this is, um, this is Linus Torvalds as dragged through Eric Raymond. That's, um, uh, Linus made the original observation, but not in that language. And, and, and Raymond in Cathedral of the Bazaar said essentially, essentially this. And there's, there's two different pieces to that. One is you know, the basic observation that, that you just you get a lot more innovation if you have a lot more people working on it. The other is, and this is one of the great, great themes of the age, problems that we used to think were hard because we had to work through them, when they can be massively parallelized, suddenly become relatively easy. Right? And so the idea of making a new map of downtown Haiti from scratch, as OpenStreetMap does, uh, if that problem can be massively parallelized and to some degree automated with, with, with GPS devices, um, suddenly, becomes a, suddenly becomes a lot easier. Um, but it is, it is, particularly for protocol-driven organizations, to John's earlier point, it is very difficult for protocol-driven organizations who are concerned not just with information and provenance to accept massively parallel, information produced in massively parallel fashion as being uh, frankly proof of or even really evidence of anything. So that's that's one of the big um, it's exactly this this observation there that, that, that I think leads to part of the culture. There's another point on yes. um, the, the the challenge that we ran across in Haiti was this massive parallelization, particularly in you know, open street map, needed a coordination mechanism. Because mm -hmm. now you had people, thousands of people looking at a map uh, many of whom were working in the same areas, beginning to overwrite each other's work because they were working so fast, actually opening editors over each other's work. Yeah. Uh, you can do this in a wiki, you can do this in many other formats. Uh, the problem now is not, Ushiki is solving a problem putting dots on a map. We can put reports to a place, but now we have to create a collective intelligence that allows us to make sense out of it, and it allows us to coordinate the activity of the people around it. We're not there yet. That's the problem we're trying to solve. Oh, yes. Yeah, actually. Has there been any visualization, usage of uh, Shahidi about like, you know, normal common usage, for example, uh, municipality reporting? Like, uh, you're on the street, you see, like, the lights off, you report that in a simple way. It's a pothole one. Sheet like this? 
Yeah, well, the, right. Berkowitz's thing, which is which is secret, called secret fix, which is a which is a, a, a way of reporting files. But I think someone's also done pot, a pothole reporting installed in Shahidi. I forget where it was. Uh, Colorado somewhere. It's on. It's on. It's on. If, if you if you go to the rollover map, there's a new one in Prague that they just. It's in Czech. If anyone can recheck, but around <laughs> contested public space, uh, contested <laughs> public spaces in. Uh, and like examples of that in the uh, project. That might generate like the public awareness and like yeah. the, the, the possibility. Of, uh, mm -hmm. See, this is the success of Ushihidi's marketing, cam marketing campaign. Because mm -hmm. like, people looked at Ushihidi to do things that other applications are already doing. Yeah, Google Maps is, is perfect. I mean, the, the Chicago crime map was probably the first famous, uh, you know, lat long data piped to a map. You actually don't need Ushihidi if you have the upstream data. Um, Ushahidi, in fact, started to do the SMS bridging, which was which was and remains, alas, still the hardest piece. But it may be that Ushahidi becomes the brand name for, uh, to Leah's point, becomes the brand name for for crowd mapping in general if they add enough what's called syntactic sugar. If they add enough easy ways to do these things around the around the basic uh, lat long database. Um, that having been said, I think the people working on the civic uh, the civic piece of this tend to use either Google Maps natively or go for something like C-Click Fix, which is um, C-Click Fix is designed for American politicians in particular to be able to adopt it to show their constituents that they're being responsive uh, to, to issues like garbage not being picked up, road repairs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but the, you know, the, the spread of mapping generally is much, you know, vast, vast superset of Ushahidi. Um, but, and it, it remains to be seen whether or not Ushihidi remains a short-term patch and the rest of the mapping catches up, or the other happens, which is that Ushihidi becomes, or crowd map becomes the brand name for, for, for crowd mapping. There's an ecosystem problem and all that, too. Which is? So, all the stuff that you saw happen with Haiti couldn't have happened without a map. And it didn't happen because of Google Maps. Google had really sparse data on WordPress. It was because of OpenStreetMap that Haiti worked, that Ushahidi was able to make its name Haiti. OpenStreetMap mapped a country in three weeks. And if any of you are in cartography, the, the concept <laughs> of mapping a country in three weeks, or most of it, in three weeks is mind-boggling. This was 1.1 million edits in three weeks. Uh, I encourage you to go. Kate Chapman just published a blog post, a paper on the analysis of that stream. Uh, I'd encourage you to go look at uh, uh, Map user is her her, uh, her blog. And let me let me um, end by making I think two two final points related to that. All of these systems, this is what I sort of meant in particular by highlighting this: all miles are wrong, some miles are used. <coughs> and it, people who've been in my class hear me say this: there, all of these. Think about all of these systems require that we adopt the economists' uh, in-house editorial model, which is simplify then exaggerate. Right, what you do is you take a piece of the system you care about, you, you behave as if it's the most important piece of the system, whether it is or not. Plainly, what went on in Haiti was not primarily about Ushahidi, but to talk about <coughs> Ushahidi, we have to bring it forward, and then we have to exaggerate the facts. So the, um, that's, that's by way of priming people's ability to see these systems uh, operating. But in fact, it's, you know, it's all embedded in this, in this much larger context. And the other observation is that the ecosystem problem, is, as you said, is endemic to these uh, to these issues, but also has the also has the possibility of amplification. Uh, crowd map would not be possible without Ushahidi, but it would also not be possible without Linux, because Linux is the only thing that makes the cloud possible. You have to have a free operating system to have an unlimited number of unlicensed versions of something running around. Uh, they would not have been able to do what they did in Haiti if they had not had OpenStreetMap. They would not have been able to do what they did in Haiti if they did not have Crowdflower. And so the part of the exaggeration, the simplification of the exaggeration for any open system uh, is to assume that all of the other open systems are, are inputs for it. Um, it would, if you wanted to account for the, the, the you know, as John was saying, in order to account for the remarkable uh, technological victories in Haiti, you would be better off treating Ushihidi as an input to the need for OpenStreetMap and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So you would do a different analysis if what you cared about was crisis cartography as opposed to, uh, you cared about the building of the map rather than putting the dots on the map. So I don't, um, 
for the purposes of this conversation, we brought Ushi into the fort because we wanted to show you all crowd map. Uh, you could do this entire presentation again with Crowdflower and Ushahidi and OpenStreetMap would be an input to that. You could do it again with OpenStreetMap and Ushahidi and Crowdflower would be an input to that. So don't don't think of uh, don't think of the centrality of Ushahidi to this conversation as being the same as the centrality of Ushahidi in the world. It is uh, it is interactive and systemic all the way, uh, all the way around. And thank you all thank you all for coming out. <laughs> <laughs>